welcome everybody to the second in our current series of webinars where today we're discussing the topic of ethnicity put my teeth in before i start and road safety so we'll have two presentations today i'm going to begin by presenting some analysis exploring pedestrian risk and ethnicity and then i'll be followed by a presentation by nicola and holly who are going to speak about a project delivered for birmingham city council and we've got rebecca here as well and um, they used innovative behavioural science techniques to address road safety risk within a specific community. We'll then hold a discussion taking questions from you. So please use the chat function to, you, to, to pose those questions. If you start your message with the word question, it just makes it a lot easier for me to come back to them at the end. So please add those questions in as we go along and then we'll come back and, and speak to them at the end. So um, we've got 37 in the room. There will be a few stragglers as we go along, but let's make a start. So those of you who are familiar with Stats 19 will know that we have access to some sociodemographic data, which helps us to understand who's exposed to increased risk on the road. So we can analyze sex and age data, and we can use postcode information in a number of different ways. We can look at the differences between the crash location and where the casualty or driver lives. We can explore the deprivation and morality levels of those home locations. And we can use sociodemographic profiling tools like Mosaic and Acorn to understand the typical characteristics of those casualties and drivers in overrepresented locations. But where does ethnicity come to this, into this? Do we know if there are differences in risk? So we collaborated with Living Streets to understand risk within different communities. So whilst ethnicity is not recorded in Stats 19, we still use Stats 19 to understand casualty risk, analysing 10 years of data. We then used the most recent census data from 2011, using a similar methodology to one employed in a 2007 study in London. Now, as we were working with Living Streets, we concentrated on pedestrians, but it's possible to uh, repeat this analysis on other casualty groups. We also undertook deprivation analysis alongside the ethnicity analysis. There is a well-established link between road safety risk and deprivation. So we wanted to understand the relationships between risk, deprivation and ethnicity. So I just want to start by pointing out some limitations with this analysis. Obviously, as I said, we use the 2011 census and Britain has changed a lot over the last 10 years and the ethnic composition of the country is not the same as it was back then. We've used 10 years of collision data, so that should help to mitigate some of these, um, um, you know, some of the changes over that time. But what we really do want you to do is think about these results and interpret them thinking about how the most recent census might look. Um, but we were limited. We had to use that data because there isn't actually any other source of ethnicity at postcode level. Now, the ethnic classifications in the census are the same in England and Wales, but not in Scotland. So this analysis only looks at England and Wales. It would require a matching exercise for us to incorporate, or incorporate the Scottish data and align those two classifications. We did amalgamate groups, although the 10 year casualty data sample we've got is large enough to explore individual ethnic groups in future analysis. So we could delve down into the groups um, and those are the groups which are shown in that table there, which are shown, which are the ones used in the 2011 census. We classified ethnicity at postcode level, but then we analysed at a much higher geographical level for data protection issues. So we actually matched casualty postcodes to ONS output area. So as we've seen, ethnicity isn't recorded in Stats 19, even though perhaps it could be included, even if it was self-reported. But we do have the postcodes of the casualties and the 2011 census provides the relative populations of each ethnic group at postcode level, which we could then match to those casualty postcodes. So this method is completely unreliable at an individual level, but the weighting can provide an appropriate proxy for the number of casualties from each ethnic group when aggregated at a national level. So, for example, if a casualty lives in a postcode whose population is a 10th ethnic minority, excluding white minorities, this casualty will count as 0.1 ethnic minority casualties when aggregated. 
So these are proximate casualty numbers by ethnicity. Um, and so we need to view them in the context of what proportions of the population these ethnic groups comprise and hence what numbers of casualties we would expect from each ethnic group in an equi ideal equitable society. So as such, we've calculated and analysed and compared casualty rates per 100,000 population, which represent the ratio between the observed number of casualties of an individual ethnicity to the expected number of casualties of that ethnicity based solely on population share. What that means basically is that if 30% of the population were from ethnic minority groups, we might expect 30% of casualties from ethnic minority groups if risk was equal. As I've already touched upon, the final element of our analysis was to look at, uh, was to use the index of deprivation to understand the role of relative deprivation. For this work, we focused on the pedestrian casualties who live in the 25% most deprived and the 25% least deprived neighbourhoods. So our total number of match casualties, i.e. those we had um, uh, postcodes for, was 189,102. And you can see how these were distributed as casualties between ethnic groups um, classified as white, um, uh, which includes English, Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish, British, Gypsy or Irish traveller, Irish and other white. And then we also had ethnic minorities, which excludes the white minorities and were the remaining minor, uh, ethnicities on that earlier slide. So looking at the 25% most and least deprived communities, 101,858 pedestrian casualties lived in these neighbourhoods, which means that 54% of casualties live in the 50% of communities covering the least and most deprived areas. And we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Now, you can already see from these um, percentages um, that there is a disparity emerging. So overall, 27.4% of pedestrian casualties are from an ethnic minority, but this increases to 29.8% when we're only looking at the most and least deprived casualties. So what does this mean? Well, it shows here that per 100,000 population, there were 62 pedestrian casualties who were one of who were from one of the ethnic minority groups and live in a deprived community. At the other end, there were 20 pedestrian casualties per 100,000 population from the least deprived communities and who were white. This means that ethnic minority pedestrians from deprived communities are three times more likely to be injured on English and Welsh roads than white non-deprived pedestrians. One of the other inter interesting insights here is that the annual number of casualties per 100,000 people is very similar for those from the least deprived neighbourhoods, regardless of ethnicity. However, when we look, to, look at those deprived communities, um, uh, not only does risk increase significantly for all residents, but those from an ethnic minority are for a much greater risk. So there is no doubt, therefore, that deprivation plays an important role in pedestri increasing pedestrian risk, but it's most definitely not the only factor and ethnicity adds to the influence of deprivation. So as I've just said, deprivation is most definitely playing a part in this, and we already know about this link from many other studies. In this data, 39.1% of pedestrian casualties came from the 25% most deprived communities. However, as I've just said, deprivation is highly influential when it comes to ethnic minority groups, with over half of the ethnic minority pedestrian casualties living in the most deprived communities, the 25% communities. So I touched upon a moment ago, the rates by ethnic minority, uh, sorry, by ethnic group are similar in the non-deprived areas, but it really is starkly different when we look at those most deprived communities. And if we look at something like, uh, you know, to try and look at other sources like the National Travel Survey, it, it reveals disparity in modal choice. So within more deprived communities, residents walk more frequently. And the proportion of black adults who have no access to a car is twice that of white adults. So this analysis can help us to understand disparities in risk that we were not previously aware of, because as we've said, it isn't in STATS 19. But what we don't know from this is why or what we can do to redress the balance. We know deprivation is an influencing factor in road safety. So how strong is its role when it comes to the risk of different uh, ethnic communities? 
As I said at the beginning, this analysis was only looking at pedestrians. How does risk differ for other road user groups? And can we delve further into the ethnic groupings to understand which communities are at heightened risk? And there's an awful lot of additional work to be done to understand these risks before we start thinking about solutions. And I wouldn't want to make any assumptions based on this data we've analysed to date. I've just put on this slide, you know, we need to think through a safe system approach about access to vehicles, about neighbourhood design, speed limit setting, road user behaviours, both those of the pedestrian and um, vehicle drivers, and post-collision responses. Um, but we, we can't answer from this. What we're doing with this analysis is really just highlighting the fact that there is a there's a problem here. So the fact that we found that there's an issue, I think it's probably a really good time to hand over to Nicola, who can talk about how we get the data off the computer and into communities to really think about um, how we understand risk. So I'm going to stop presenting and I'm going to hand over to Nicola, hopefully. Thank you, Tanya. Um, just bear with me a second whilst I get my slides up. Fantastic. Um, so as Tanya mentioned, we are a behavioural science company. We're based in the northwest of England. Um, we work on a whole raft of different kind of challenges. Recently, we've been doing a lot of work around coronavirus, but we do specialise in road safety. And the first project our company ever embarked upon was in road safety. So um, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating area in which to work. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that is so hot off the press that I literally finished the slides about 15 minutes ago. And um, you are the first people to, to hear about this. And it's a project we're really excited about. And um, it was delivered with Birmingham City Council and um, funded by the Road Safety Trust. Um, so let's just crack on. So basically, um, the image on the right was created in response to a hidden inequality. At this point, I'm not going to give you any more detail. I'm going to let you guess what that inequality might be and the cohort it's affecting. I think not too hard if you, if you study the poster on the right. But what's really interesting is when we tested this um, in a randomised trial, it outperformed national comparator campaigns in terms of intent, the intent to wear a seatbelt, um, the emotional response of the viewer, and the self-reported willingness to share that message with others. So how do behavioural scientists influence your behaviour? Now, when people learn that we're a behavioural science company, um, first, we can generally guarantee there are two responses. First of all, they're intrigued, um, and second, they're a little wary. And I think that sometimes we do come across a common misconception that we use psychology to create almost hidden traps that manipulate or trick people into doing something they're unaware of or would otherwise not choose to, to do. And uh, sometimes even jokingly referred to as the dark arts. Whereas in reality, we are far less enigmatic uh, and far more um, prosaic and practical. We rely on data and the behavioral insights we uncover we use to design interventions that help people to achieve the things that most people would generally consider bring benefits to themselves and to society as a whole. We nudge for good. So, for example, like not becoming a road traffic collision. So we are not going to talk about um, the, the methodology we use. That's there on the bottom of the slide. Um, it is something we created. Um, and it integrates the principles and models of applied behavioural science in a commercial kind of model. But for the purpose of today, I thought it'd be really useful to extract six things that anyone can do to design solutions that have a better chance of detecting and overcoming behavioural um, problems. The other thing I need to mention very quickly is that this piece of work is currently at the pre-test stage. It's not live as an active campaign. So the six things I would recommend to anybody who's looking to um, solve a behavioural problem with any group of people is to spend time finding the right problem to solve. Um, to develop a hypothesis, you can test. 
to spot the things that others are missing. Now, often when people ask us to come on board, it's because they've had a few goes at trying to solve the problem themselves. And so it's really important that we look beyond the obvious, um, that you recognize your limitations of knowledge and power, and um, you seek to uncover insights. For us, those are behavioral insights, but you know anything that gives you the why of a problem is gonna help you. Once you know the why, you can start to design a solution. And finally, we would always recommend pre-testing any solution before rolling it out. It saves you money in the long run. So let's start with number one, identify the right problem. There's a famous quote that's attributed to Albert Einstein, who was reportedly once asked if he had an hour to save the world, how would you spend the hour? And he replied, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and then five minutes solving it. Now, whether he said that or not, I think it's really interesting because it recognized the importance of accurately diagnosing the problem in the root cause. When Birmingham City Council approached us, they knew what their problem was. They were concerned about high casualty rates in a, quite a large area of the city that we're gonna to refer to as A2 North, um, which is um, within East Birmingham. Now, they didn't know um, why casualty rates were so high, but they did have initial hypothesis that it could be down to young men who were driving fancy prestige cars who are at the root of the problem. Now, if you know anything about Birmingham, that's not as surprising as you might think. On-street racing and car culture is a concern in Birmingham. And around the time, there have been some notable and really upsetting incidents um, that were really salient to, to people and were front of mind. But I suppose what is interesting at this point to ask is what would have happened if we'd acted on that initial hypothesis and designed a solution to that problem? Well, let's look at the evidence. So Tanya Fosdick um, has worked with us many times and we have worked with her and she's an incredible analyst, as you know. Um, but Holly Hope Smith, who's um, our head of behavioral science, who you'll be hearing from later, um, is also a data scientist. So when they get together, they're, they're pretty amazing. And when they looked at the data, we uncovered some really interesting things. So first of all, we found that whilst collisions involving male drivers at night are overrepresented in the data, targeting this group would only tackle a really small minority of the collisions. And if we drill down further, we could see that targeting drivers of prestige cars would have had almost no impact, both in terms of actual and relative risk, the numbers were very, very small. What we later found was that probably the real reason this area had higher deaths and injuries could be explained by a very large numbers of pedestrian casualties, approximately 33% of all casualties in this area um, or people traveling to these areas um, were, um, were, were pedestrian, sorry, were passenger casualties. And as you can see from the graph on the right, those peaked around the ages of 16 to 24. So we thought that this kind of suggested something else and that part of the problem may lie um, in non-seatbelt use. Which brings me on to my next recommendation, that you develop a hypothesis you can test. Now, we tested our initial, initial hypothesis and we were able to discount it. But now we've got a new one, um, and that is people in A2 North are not wearing seatbelts. So what could we do to test that? Well, we did a couple of things that were really helpful in trying to test this. First of all, we had lots and lots of community conversations with people from all across the community. And one of the things we were repeatedly hearing was the sentence or the line, no one wears a seatbelt around here. So whilst most people probably were, it tells us that there was a norm or, or um, a, an anticipated norm that most people weren't. And that was really interesting. It was interesting enough for us to design a quasi experimental study design, which basically we used to collect observational data on 507 vehicles. And we did this by observing occupants of those cars, vehicles that were stopped. We used traffic lights at junctions and literally counting with colleagues from Birmingham City Council, um, the number of occupants and the number of occupants who are wearing seat belts. And from that, we were able to find what I felt was quite a startling statistic. And that was the rate of non-wearing hugely deviated from the um, national average of non-wearing, which is set at around 8%. Here, we were able to detect 38%, which is a staggering five times higher. So I'm just gonna let that sink in because for us, that was 
really kind of confirmed our initial hypothesis that there was a behaviour to be shifted here and that in shifting that behaviour, um, hopefully we could reduce both the number and severity of collisions. Well, was there a behavioural... Um, was there a... Um, sorry, am I on the right? Was there a behavioural opportunity? Well, a commonly known framework that you may already be aware of is the COMB model of behavioural change, and um, it's very well known. And it allows you to check whether the required elements for behavioural change are in place in order for that behaviour to be routinely undertaken. So um, in most instances, um, people need to have the capability to perform the behaviour. They need to have the opportunity to do so and be motivated. When we think about seat belt use, we can be pretty sure that most people are capable particularly over the age of about four, are capable of fastening a seatbelt and they know how to do so. In terms of opportunity, all modern cars are fitted with a seatbelt. And motivation, um, well, we could say that most people will have an intrinsic motivation to protect themselves from harm and seatbelts do just that. But we didn't know much about the community that we were looking at. And, um, and, and so it was kind of important that, you know, we, we were able to understand whether there was any motivational barrier um, and certainly this model would point you in that direction. So my third recommendation is you really look to see what others have missed. And the hard data, as Tanya rightly said, will seldom give you, it'll give you the what, where, when, how and who, but it seldom gives you the why of the problem, nor will it necessarily guide you towards the most optimal solution. To do that, we would usually undertake a behavioural deep dive. And the biggest question in our minds at this point was this. Why have decades of really high profile, well regarded seatbelt campaigns supported by a change in the law that made it a punishable offence not to wear one? Why had that been so successful in changing the behaviour of the majority population? And why was it seemingly less effective in the communities that we looked at. What had gone wrong? You know, we were seeing a deviation five times the national, the national average. Um, so we had a look at the, um, the very things that had been so successful in the first place. And we looked at print campaigns um, to do with seatbelt use from around the 1960s to the present day. And we also looked at um, the majority of the um, um, main advertisements that were shown on mainstream television. And I want to ask you, given what you know of the population, which I'm not sure, I, actually I didn't mention this, that the other thing we found was that, um, and, and you may have guessed this already from the first slide, was that the vast majority of these casualties were being experienced by people of South Asian origin. And we discovered that when we overlaid collision and casualty data with um, social demographic and consumer data. These were very settled communities. There hadn't been a lot of shifts since the last cen um, census. So we're fairly confident that we could say that this problem was affecting um, a particular um, segment of the Birmingham population with, with some confidence. So we know um, that there is a high passenger casualty rate. We are pretty, we, we've been able to test a hypothesis around seatbelts and we know the who, who it is affecting. So why when we look at these advertisements might um, we, 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 we say that they were less effective? Does anybody in the chat want to, to have a go at kind of guessing that? And uh, Tanya, I'll ask you to sort of monitor that. Any, any, any thinking? Carol, all white, only white people. Yeah. Little South but, Asian representation. Yeah. yeah. So when we looked at all these, we found some common things. So we were seeing particularly primarily white British people who seem to come from a relatively middle class, safe and secure background. Um, there was actually, I think around 2006, a South Asian person introduced but that was one person from years and years and years of road safety targeting. Um, and so when people from South Asian communities saw these campaigns, 
they were not seeing a reflection of themselves or their lives. Again, you might ask, why is that important? Well, the majority of those campaigns used heightened emotion as a device to um, shift behavioural change. And emotion is really important because emotion is an important catalyst of cognitive processing. In other words, if you are seeing something that heightens your emotion, it will increase your ability to pay and sustain attention, to engage with the message, and in trials that have been conducted where they have considered emotional uh, levers in behavioural campaigns, emotion has also been proven to increase recall of the contents of a particular message at a later time. So they're able to draw upon that time when the behaviour is needed. All of those campaigns were using heightened emotion as their main device. But remember, if you do not see yourself in, an, in something, then you are less likely to have the same response. You are less likely to empathise. And, and that means that your, um, your ability to engage and recall the message is far lower. Not only that, um, but as we began to see digital channels emerging, the viewing patterns of the population changed. These stayed on mainstream channels. Um, a lot of viewing time from South Asian communities did not. So we arrived at our conclusion that possibly what we were seeing was inadvertently message not received. Great. So here we are, we've arrived at the problem. And we kind of basically developed a logic that went around the idea of if we could increase use of seatbelts, we'd see a reduction in passenger casualties. And we also hypothesized that any intervention to increase seatbelt use would need to be tailored and targeted to a South Asian population. So bingo. All we had to do was design an emotionally resonant image and set of messaging tailored to South Asian demographic, and we'd have solved the problem. Off we went, except for one problem. And this is why number four, it's important to recognize your limitations. How would someone like me actually know what it feels like to be a young South Asian teenager living in Birmingham today. I have no idea. I don't know about their values, their experiences. I don't know what's going to influence their behaviour. So once we recognised this gap, this limitation, we had to overcome it. And we did that by building an online community of 25 young people who we asked to share some more about their lives, to be co-researchers and to help us uncover, number four, the behavioural insights we would need to help change that behaviour. And it was wonderful. We basically um, had six weeks with 25 young people who shared their lives with us. They showed us what they were, the kind of language that is, you know, they, they use as young people every day, what they drive, what they cherish, what they fear you're losing. We found about the influence of family and friends and practical things too, like how they share news and information. And we did that using a, um, a, a process of ethnographic research. This was also during the pandemic, during lockdown. So we had to find an innovative way to engage. And I won't spend long on this, but basically what this is, is a digital platform that um, they can communicate with a laptop, an iPad or their phones. And every day, the young people would be set a different task, which was designed to give us a greater level of insight into the drivers of their behaviour and information we might need for tailoring. So we can sort of see here we've got kind of a kind of a card sorting one, I think, going on here. Um, let's see if that moves on. Yeah, so we can rank things. Um, we can ask them to do a whole range of things which gave us information. So it gave us lots of useful information and insight. It told us that people generally, young people generally thought did the, the time they were least likely to wear the seatbelt was on short distances, you know, and particularly say when they were sitting in the back of a car. Um, it told us about, um, you know, it mostly happened um, at what times, but we were missing the one thing that was going to unlock that challenge and give us the key to solving the problem. And then we found it. So remember this, capability, opportunity, motivation, capable of fastening a seatbelt, opportunity, cars have seatbelts, motivation. 
One of the things that people often use, and it's it's a controversial one, but fear guides our motivation, the fear of harm. The fear that in not doing something or in doing something, we increase our risk of death or injury. When we measured young people's risk perceptions in relation to various risky behaviours, we found that not wearing a seatbelt scored as very low risk. They did not feel that not wearing a seatbelt put them particularly at increased chance of harm. Now, to use fear to influence behaviour, the person that you're trying to influence needs to feel that risk is very real. So think about coronavirus. People felt very real, that the risk was real. It was genuinely frightening and that they were vulnerable or susceptible to harm. And then there was something simple that it could do to protect them from that risk. Young people do not think that they are going to die. And they particularly do not think that not wearing a seatbelt on a, on a short journey is going to cause them to die or be injured. So a fear-based strategy will not work because they do not feel susceptible. But the next thing we found was far more exciting. We found our way through that. What we found was that whilst the young people we engage could not envisage being killed or injured as a direct result of not wearing a seatbelt, that they did not believe they can die in that way, we were able to trigger a strong and powerful emotional response when we were able to get them to perceive of non-wearing of non a seatbelt may lead to the perceived loss of a future goal or attainment. This is something that felt far more present and real to them. So anticipated regret is a behavioral insight. And it's that sinking feeling or feeling of guilt or feeling of fear that is very, very physical that you can experience in the present moment of the regret we may expect to feel in the future as a direct consequence of a decision or an action that we're currently considering taking. And that's commonly a loss of something prized or cherished to that individual. And that really unpleasant feeling of something that may happen in the future as a result of something you're about to do now can have a powerful influence on our current decisions and behavior. So this was something that we now knew we could use. And we started working with the young people. And we started asking them to sort of show us things like, well, what artifacts, if you stumbled upon them, would trigger a really powerful loss response? You know, you know, something of a sibling or a parent, something that they might symbolize, you know, so something others might symbolize that if they saw it like a teddy bear of a younger sibling or, or the watch I think was used of a mother would bring that feeling of, of loss and anticipated regret. And we also asked them in relation to themselves. And they were great. They gave us lots and lots of information, lots and lots of ideas. And we were starting to co-design the campaign at this point with the young people themselves. And so we were able to develop and mock up various concepts around things that was kind of young people prized and, they, and they'd imagined and they invested in having. Um, this is an idea of a wedding day that didn't occur um, that could be protected through a simple act of wearing a seatbelt. And this went on for a while and we developed various contact co sort of concepts and some performed well and some less well. And finally, the last thing we did was we actually then started to develop them up into a set of prototypes. That they were able to rank um, what you can see on the right is a heat map with linked comments such as the one below the line. And it also allowed us to check for authenticity. If you hit a bad note, if you say something that no one would say, it undermines all your good work. So this was a really important part of the process. And at this point, we ended our working relationship with our young people, because actually, number five, in order to pretest our solution, we needed to go out to a group of new young people who had had no exposure involvement up until this point. So <clears throat> we've gone as far as we can go. We now have our best guess as at the artifact we can use to influence um, seatbelt use uh, by using the device of anticipated regret and a few other behavioral insights that we, we uncovered. And we needed to test it. So we recruited um, a new cohort of young people. Um, we managed to recruit 335 young people, of whom approximately 50% were from the South Asian community in Birmingham. <clears throat> and each of those people was shown only one campaign. 
and the campaign that they saw was randomised. We didn't know who saw what. And that was done to reduce chance of confounding. And that just means removing anything that might influence those results. So the present, what they presented with completely randomised. Um, and when we selected the comparators to compare our AMED campaign with, um, we set ourselves some parameters to reduce our own bias. <clears throat> so we looked for the most recent national campaign and seatbelt use, which was the one I think. <clears throat> We looked for the most recent regional one that we could find that also had a high resolution, sort of a high enough resolution image. And we also created a decoy or a dummy, which is the one on the far right, which was an information only campaign. It had absolutely no emotional levers or tailoring or behavioral insights in it at all. So we had no idea what would happen when we put it to the test. And sometimes what you learn is what doesn't work rather than what does. <clears throat> So what were the results? Well, we kind of told you those up front. Um, when we tested the Ahmed uh, tailored campaign in a randomized trial, Ahmed outperformed all comparative campaigns in terms of um, self-reported intention to wear a seatbelt, uh, willingness to share the, the message with others, and emotional response. And these measures were all selected because they give us the most reliable indicators of how well a message will be processed, how easily it might be recalled, and how promising it is that we can kind of achieve reach within a particular desired cohort. So that was great. But let's just look at the emotional response one because you're not stupid. And when you look at these campaigns, actually, there's only one of these campaigns that's really going for the emotional response, and that was ours. It was obviously um, similar to the national. It was tailored at a young person, but there's very much the idea of a sense of a loss, somebody who's losing out on a, on a future, whereas the others, I would argue, have less of that. So emotion, again, just to remind you, is important. It engages the viewer and aids memorability of message. So I'm just going to have to explain this to you. So we compared the Ahmed campaign at the top with um, the regional campaign, which you see here on the right, the national campaign and our information only campaign. Now, the blue dotted line across the bottom is the baseline. That is where the each of those campaigns were. Um, that's a baseline for them. The red here relates to the Ahmed campaign and the red dot in the middle um, <clears throat> tells us that when we actually, that people viewing the Ahmed campaign scored a higher emotional response in comparison to the emotional response recorded by people viewing the regional poster. And if we look at the red dot here, we can see that's just over three times greater than the response recorded by the regional, people viewing the regional one. Great. Actually, the emotional response to the national one was even higher. So the deviation here was four times greater. People who viewed our Ahmed campaign were experiencing four times greater the emotional level of response than people who are viewing this campaign. And surprisingly, I guess, the information only campaign, perhaps because it used powerful words like injury or death, although it's factual, um, people who viewed the Ahmed campaign reported um, uh, an emotional response that was two and a half times greater than the emotional response um, that was generated by people viewing the, um, the, the information only campaign. So that's really interesting. We know that there's something in the idea of anticipated regret that will have an effect across all young people. But what was really, really interesting was when we then went into look, break down those figures further to look at the randomized control trial results for South Asian respondents only. So what we found there was fascinating. On the metric of emotion, the campaign that was tailored to South Asian young people had a far greater emotional effect on the people that it was designed and tailored to, designed for and tailored to, that was approximately five times greater. 
that's really important because we have told you already that an emotional response aids recall and when we tested people who had viewed this on whether they could correctly recall the message 72 percent of young people could recall that message and that's really high so what this tells us is that that shift that was achieved between those two cohorts tells us that tailoring works you will get a more enhanced response when you are tailoring information and imagery to a to the needs and the values of a particular cohort it also tells us that emotion as a lever is really effective on a number of levels so um, i'm going to wrap up here but just to recap the six steps I think are really important. I think that anybody can try to build them into your approach. Um, start by identifying the right problem, test your hypotheses, look for the things that could are missing, the things that aren't obvious, um, recognize your limitations, and that if that is lived experience, engage with the people who um, you know the problem is is affecting most. Look to uncover your insights and pre-test your solution. But final word on ethnicity. Stats 19 data, as we all know, is not calibrated to show up this type of problem. The who in this instance was missing, but it doesn't mean you can't find out hidden health inequalities or hidden road safety inequalities, but you just need to work a little harder. And by linking data, we were able to do just that. I think the other thing that was really important here is recognizing that a one size all approach doesn't always work and that tailoring can help you overcome that. But for me, the biggest thing of all is nothing to do with seatbelts. It's nothing to do with South Asian populations. It's the fact that when we think about some of the biggest challenges that are facing highways, transportation and modality today, like um, reduction in carbon emissions, uh, modal shift, you cannot solve those types of problem by changing the behaviour of part of the population. These have to be whole population responses. And no one wants to discover in 20 years time that actually you left behind a part of your population. You can't afford to do that. So I think for me, that's the big learning from this. Design up front, use your data well, use your insight well, make sure when you are designing, you are designing to meet the needs of everyone. And I think we will hopefully see some real progress against some of those challenges. If this is something that you are looking to learn a little bit more about, we are holding a more in-depth kind of workshop, um, which you can sign up to here, um, maybe take a screenshot of the screen, or I think we can probably send it out, can't we, Tanya? But Tanya's also speaking at that one, so you, you get the best of both of us a little bit more. And uh, we're doing some workshops there, which kind of take this further. Thank you very much. Um, I rattled through that really quickly because I know we've got a lot to go through, but I hope you found that interesting. Um, before we move on, Tanya, I just wonder, um, Rebecca's here from Birmingham, and I just thought, is it worth kind of, maybe Rebecca, would you would you be okay to say a couple of words about how you experience this uh, as a local authority? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So um, I think I've been thinking about the, you know, sort of the new direction that we've taken with um, the work that we've done in partnership with SOMO on this project. And I think um, local authority colleagues will will feel this, that historically, a lot of our approach to, to tackling road safety problems has really, really focused on where, where is the problem? And then what is our engineering solution that we can put in to design out that problem as much as we can? And we're coming to that point where we've done an awful lot of that and that, you know, there we still have accidents and collisions on our roads um, and that we want to, you know, move beyond what what can we do next? And even historically, I mean, local authorities do have a statutory duty around road safety education, but traditionally that that's taken quite a particular form, you know, going into schools, talking about learning how to cross the road, that sort of thing, albeit for in our area, funding for that type of activity has reduced. And it's looking at how do we actually smartly fulfil this road safety education um, obligation um, to, to as, as sort of talking with Nick with what Nick has been talking about to, to find the right people and solve the right problems not just go for oh, we, you know we've got to do some of this because we are you know we've been quite a formulaic approach we can look at where we're getting speeding reports we can look at are there particular interventions there we have our local safety engineering program it's quite expensive but it's quite easy this sort of work is less expensive than it is to actually bring in the engineering solutions but it's not easy and we have found you know working partnership that once we'd got that cohort of young people 
what could be achieved was fantastic getting that cohort of young people and then particularly getting them the the new cohort who we just wanted to fill in um a bit of a, a survey for us to do that testing that's been really really hard and it's investment of time and investment in people um perhaps more than it is you know let's just allocate a bit from our capital program that that solves this problem so i think that's a, a real sort of learning for us to say, you know, we've we've looked at behavioural change interventions. You know, modal shift has always been, a, you know, the last twenty years or so, certainly in my career, been a focus on on behaviour change, and that's, you know, you get good value for money, but it's not easy. But we've never really used those insights um, in road safety and done this sort of deep dive that really focuses on what is the problem um, and then finding the right solution. So I think for us, it's yeah, it's that learning that really we need to be investing time in communities to build those links to start to be able to do this kind of work more effectively rather than starting cold and saying right we need to find some people from this target demographic to have those links established and that's not to diminish work that you know we have got some links and you know some of my colleagues are in here and I wouldn't want to diminish the work that they already had linked with those communities but I think it's a real challenge for us to get that depth um, and to get those partnerships and to see sort of where we go next. And particularly, we're in the process at the moment of um, refreshing our road safety strategy. And it's interesting because the one that we wrote, what, about six, or seven years ago, we focused, we had safer roads, safer vehicles, safer people as our themes. And still, I don't think we cracked the safer people. And I think this starts to give us an insight into to where we go next to try and really focus on that section of, of safer people and the people involved and talking to the right ones. So I hope that's a bit of a useful reflection from us. That's great, Rebecca. Thank you. And as you're talking, lots and lots and lots of questions are coming through. So um, I'm going to go back to the ones from uh, my presentation just because they're probably quicker and easier to, to answer. Um, so in terms of uh, there's questions about kind of other data sets, mental he health um, analysed. It was a very, very um, uh, direct um piece of analysis that we did that was it was very very limited and so we, we've got no idea of what is going on um, around here so some of those other questions about kind of men being discharged from prison or we've got no idea who these individuals are all we were really doing was proving that there is an issue and similarly Tim talked about have we looked at the road condition within these deprived areas that really is the next step is to think about well which communities are they where are they speed limits road design pedestrian access all of these things we've got no idea on it's just the fact that you know, we were identifying the problem because stats 19 hasn't allowed us to answer some of these questions up to now um, um, and as Sandra says, you know, this is something that has been around for a long while and I know TfL and in fact, Sandra, I remember working with you or you know, on uh, projects a long, long time ago that, that you know, this has been spoken about. But um, yeah, there really is a need to um, continue with uh, long term projects here. So let me come on to some of these interesting ones for, for you guys, uh, Holly and Nicola. So Duncan asks, did the anticipated regret of potential disfigurement crop up as prom prompting a strong emotional response? Was was that something that the young people spoke about? Um, do you want, shall I take that, Nicola? Yep, sure. We did both two different groups, so maybe Holly's had, yeah, go on. So um, I think that we looked at that in two different ways. We, we certainly thought that um, all young people um, very much value their self-image. And so we did, um, I'd say it didn't come up um, in my group within co-design particularly um, as, a, as a theme that they were worried about um, surface level things. In all, in all honesty, when they were talking about things that could have a long lasting impact, they thought more about their mental health about how being in an, in an accident might, you know, traumatise them, might be something that they have to deal with emotionally, the fact that they might lose someone that they care about. They never saw themselves as the victim, <laughs> but if they could, they could see some, you know, they might lose someone else. Um, and uh, in the mobile, when we were prototyping ideas, one of the ideas we tested was, was sort of in an Instagram, you know, very... Um, uh, rather than looking at the disfigurement side but the fact that you know we, we tried to do one didn't we about you know this is one part of your uh outfit can you remember that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't really that well received I haven't described we it thought it was great <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so in, no in, in all honesty it didn't come up 
short answer. Great, thank you. Um, was any of the campaign feedback and ideas for the campaign message from existing victims of collisions? So, and if so, how did they feel uh, towards the most effective emotive, but perhaps more troubling example that given their past trauma, did they favour or not favour the emotive in imagery? I'm happy to answer this. We we had about three people in the group who had, one had experienced the loss of a friend when he was about 12, um, which had affected him deeply and was, you know, a big driver for wanting to be part of this work. And others had lost friends or family members um, or, or been injured. Um, and what we found was that um, actually it heightened their desire to, to be involved. Um, they strongly felt emotion. They, they obviously were people who did perceive risk from um, road traffic collisions unlike the others. Um, but no, I think that they, they, they felt that the emotion had been a game changer for them and saw that as a powerful tool to influencing others. What young people didn't like were images with lots of gore and blood, etc. They found them off-putting or not very realistic, I think, didn't they, Holly? So this anticipated regret was massively more powerful, I think, than a lot of the other things we might have assumed that they would go for. Did and a lot of research has shown that blood and gore absolutely doesn't work, does it? So great. Um, Axel, interesting question, and it's kind of your next steps, really. How do you check or monitor that the intention of wearing a seatbelt turns into reality? So, yeah, what, what's next for this? I'm going to answer briefly, I'm going to hand over to Holly, but one thing that we could do is we used a proxy to try and establish a baseline for the project in the first place um, by going to areas of um, high, we'd had high collision stats, casualty stats from this, you know, pedestrian casualties in this locality with cohort and capturing baseline. We would probably look to expand that to get higher numbers and then repeat that during and post to see we're having an effect on seat belt wearing in the area. This would be very targeted. Um, Holly, do you want to kind of add to that? Because I know there are a number of things that you would probably think of. Well, I think before you would go and actually see if you could close the intention action gap, I think that we, we really feel that what we present today is a prototype. Mm. So we would want to um, refine it further um, and make it um, reach a wider demographic of our target community. So, for example, you know, this it features a boy. I mean, we did have a girl version, which actually did pretty well. We haven't presented that today to make it simpler. We did have two tailored campaigns, one that featured a boy, one featured a girl. And but the girl campaign did not did not work as well. Unless, unless you were a South Asian girl, <laughs> so um, it didn't it didn't work as well for everybody. So I think what we need you would want to create more than one image. We would want to keep the the core insight. You would want to then work with um, young people with different aspirations to understand what anticipated regret might be for different types of young people in the community. I think that's a really key thing to say before you would even move on to doing testing it. But absolutely, what what Nicola said would give you provided you knew that you had produced a really good campaign that you made sure that it got in front of young people and you've done all the steps so that you know that the message was received this time so that you could be absolutely certain that you've done everything you can to to do a change and then you could even you could even have the cam the campaign you could look for a comparator a comparator site where they're not presented with the campaign and see if you see a change over time um in seatbelt use in the in the area which didn't receive the campaign compared to the area they did there, there, there are lots of ways you could look at look at um testing it and finally if it got enough evidence you would want to do something national you want to put it out there and then you'd want to do something using stats 19 using some of the techniques that tanya suggested you know where you look at uh um you identify areas that have high South Asian community percentages, and then you would see in those areas, are we seeing a shift in seatbelt use, something like that, or are we seeing a shift in passenger casualties? I mean, if we saw that, then then you know you've nailed it. I think we saw that lots of other areas when we were doing and post the research, it transpired anecdotally, we're perceiving similar issues as well. So I think there would be an opportunity to do something on that that scale. Great. And that kind of leads on to um, a question from Oscar about how would you use this method to target areas, communities that have a wide range of cultures and backgrounds? Obviously, this is quite a tight knit defined community, but what about a more varied location? Um, That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, so, I think 
Do you want to go for it, Nicola? If you no, want? no, Oh, well, I was just going to say. One, Holly. <laughs> I have a response, but yours will probably be better. So you go for it. <laughs> no, um, I, was just, I was just going to say, um, I think that we were answering a specific problem. So I would go back to back two steps, really, and say in, in diverse communities where actually there is a real mix of different different ethnicities, are we is there a problem to solve first of all do is is because it could be a very there, there might not be that problem to solve there or if there is a problem it's a different one so that i would take two steps back first because there was definitely a social norms element going on wasn't there holly where perceptions of what others like them were doing was enhancing that behavior and i think you know if you were looking in a, a more ethnically diverse community you may have different things going on if you detect a problem but it might not be you know it, you would look for whatever your levers were behavioral science is used at a population level with more generic approaches you will have a weaker effect but if you've got larger numbers then a small change in a big population from something less tailored is going to bring down a sizable proportion of your problem if you look at it in actual terms um but obviously, if you're dealing with something as tailored and specific as this, then the more tailored you can get, then you're you're going to have a more um, impact on that particular cohort or population. So it depends, as Holly says, on the nature of the issue. Tanya, I'm, I'm really interested in some of your work, actually, that you did before. And um, I think that's fascinating, the, the linkages that you got between deprivation and ethnicity. What really shocked me, I'd always expected um, deprivation would have an effect, as would ethnicity, but the size of the leap was so pronounced. Do you have any kind of idea about where this might go next? Um, so it, it was this very specific project with Living Streets. I think actually we've got an awful lot of different opportunities on where we could take it next. So I think I'd be really interested in looking at the ethnic minority group and are there particular types of communities who are overrepresented more so than others. I think I would really like to look at other road user groups, so especially the deprivation. Obviously, we know the links between deprivation and pedestrian casualties, regardless of ethnicity. We know we've known that from Stats 19 for forever. Um, but does that same play out if they are drivers or they are passengers or they're motorcyclists? Is that same risk there? So um, I think there are lots of different ways we could take it. And, I'm, you know, I think it could enhance you know, work like yourselves. And, you know, how else do we, what else do we know, need to know? And I think some of the questions about from the safe system perspective, you know, is it behaviour? Is it is it speed? Is it a road use design? Is it a combination of all of them? And really doing that whole what, when, where, how thing to now sit alongside the who would be really, really interesting. So if anybody is uh, yeah uh, interested in taking this forward further, then then please come to us. Um, I know uh, we're running out of time, um, but I think there's some really interesting questions um coming up so i'm just going to pop our email address in here now because i don't have the. do you have the bitly link to the webinar that we're running holly i think um fenna may have sent it to you earlier but i'm going to pop our email address in now for ease but um if you want to kind of email us about the the webinar or the well it's not a webinar really it's more of um a workshop that we're doing um i think there'll be um a chance to um kind of continue this more then um, or if you have something specific and you want to email us for a chat, we're very happy and, you know, we can always chat to Tanya. It's something that, you know, we'd want to pick her brains on as well. But um, do you want to just pop the link into the event right for the workshops, Hall? Yeah. I, I can try. You ask me in <laughs> person. <laughs> I, yes. I can do that. I'll okay. go and grab it. I haven't got a bit leave, but I'll probably a bit um, coming before everybody disappears. Yes, because we are at three o'clock. So that seemed to go really, really quickly. So thank you both. Thank you to everybody and all of the questions. As as Nicola has just said, if you have got follow up questions, um, please feel free to email us through the normal Agilisys, um email account and, and through how you registered as well as um, through uh, the, the SOMO email there. Just before we wrap up very quickly, I just wanted to talk about the next two webinars we've got coming up. So next Tuesday, um, Duncan, who has been on the call and asking questions today, he's co-presenting with me on a another road safety trust project on a rural speed limits. And then the following um, Tuesday at two o'clock is um, hosted by Dan. Dan and it's on 20 mile an hour limits. So please register in the same way that you've registered for this one. Um, and hopefully we will see you, see you all there. 
Thank you so much today. Thank you all for um, presenting and for participating, and we hope you found it useful. Thanks um, for inviting us, Tanya. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everybody.